And we're going to jump into the Word of God. I want you to get out your notebooks. Here at the midst, we say that note takers are what? Yeah, world changer. So I just want to let you know today you are a world changer. And we're diving into week two of our series, Unapologetic. And uh, I feel like this is a part two of what we've extended on last week as we were talking. And I just believe that God has a word in the house. And so uh, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 26 to 33. And uh, we're going to continue in the story that we were on last week as Jesus has just fed the 5,000. The Bible lets us know that it's not only just 5,000, it's only 5,000 men, but now it's added men and women and children. So it's about, we're talking 10,000, possibly all the way up to 15,000 that the Lord has uh, ministered to, and not just only ministered to the spiritual need, but he's also ministered to the physical need. And the Bible says he takes two fish and five loaves of bread. Now I'm not trying to tell you two fish. Don't, if you've ever had a fish fry, fish don't divide that well in the bread. They don't make a good fish sub that well. You got to have a more fish than you have bread. But tell somebody, Jesus can do anything. Come on, I'm trying to tell you. He deboned that thing. You understand what I'm saying? He put that thing on a roll and he fed the 5,000 plus women and children and it was the best fish sub i don't care if you go to stokos i don't care if you go to mama mia's whatever is the spot around y'all way i'm trying to tell you you ain't had a fish sandwich till you met jesus amen he's got this fish sandwich and he gives it to the disciples and they distribute it to those that are groups of 50 and 100 and, and the bible says that after they have done all of this work that Jesus dismisses the disciples and he dismisses the crowd. And the disciples get into the boat and they head out into the water where some of them were never uh, afraid of. They're never um, unfamiliar with their fishermen that became fishers of men. But the Bible says Jesus goes into the mountain and he is praying. And it lets us know about the fourth hour. When you go back through verses 22 through 25, it says that Jesus does something that's a little bit different. Can I, can I, can, Jesus didn't have an Uber. Jesus didn't have a speedboat. Jesus didn't have a yacht. Jesus said, I've got what I've got. And that's my two legs. And so he said, I don't have to split water because I walk on water. I just want to let you know the kind of God that you serve. He, he doesn't have to move things. He is the very God of things. And, and so he walks on the water. And the Bible says we get to this point. Uh, where he is meeting up with the disciples. And the disciples are in the boat. And it says, but when the disciples saw him coming, walking on the sea, they were, the Bible says, terrified. Didn't even say just scared. It said they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I just want to let you know, these were all young men tough fishermen tax collectors men who 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 had some work value to them <laughs> but can i even tell you that the bible lets us know that even men get scared it lets us know it doesn't matter how tough you are it doesn't matter how 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 much put together you are that all of us get scared sometimes it says they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. I'm here today to let somebody know, no matter where you are in this moment, the Lord is speaking, take heart. He said, it is I do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, because sometimes I want to let you know the enemy is trying to impl implicate the, the voice of God. He's trying to make it as if he's speaking. Anybody ever been there before? You're asking God, Lord, what are you saying to me? And you hear a voice like, just go ahead and do it. You're like, this don't, this don't sound right. This don't, this don't feel right. This, somebody, somebody is, is trying to emulate something else that they, they have. I'm trying to let you know the enemy will act like that he's speaking from God. But I'm here today to let you know that when the Lord speaks, you can hear him clearly. The Bible says that, that Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me. Not 
See, sometimes I need a command from God. I don't need God to be suggestive. I need to give God permission to move me out of my what complacent or comfortable state and what command my situation to come onto the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came to Jesus. But the Bible says when he when he saw the wind. The wind was there all the time. It lets us know at the beginning that they were already scared. They were already understanding that they were in a windstorm. But it says when he saw the wind, here's my problem. You cannot see the wind. And there was something about the set of circumstances that Peter was in that made him fearful. I tend to think it wasn't just the wind, but it was the condition and the violence of what he was feeling from the wind. He didn't see the winner, but he felt it. And the enemy is here trying to be like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And some of us are scared of not what we see, but what we feel. (laughs) Says Peter saw the wind. Says as he sees this wind, he was afraid and And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. It doesn't matter what you're in. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gotten out there. I just want to let you know, anytime you can call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says the Lord saved them. And Jesus immediately, somebody say immediately. If you call on the Lord, he'll immediately reach out. If you call on the Lord, he'll immediately step into your set of circumstances. If you call on the name of the Lord, he'll immediately grab you out of that broken place. If you call on the name of the Lord, he'll take you out of that temptation. Sometimes in the midst of when you don't know what to do and all your emotions and feelings are stirred up, sometimes you just need to call on the name of Jesus. You need to yell out, Jesus, save me. I can't help myself in this moment. I don't have enough strength to overcome this temptation. I don't have enough strength to overcome this moment. I don't have enough strength to overcome this brokenness. Sometimes you just got to yell out, Jesus, save me right now where I am. I don't know if I'm in my right state of mind, but I need Jesus to do what? Save me. I don't care who hears me, but I'll yell it out, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. And the Bible says immediately, immediately. He reached down his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The Bible says when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Sometimes the circumstance you're in won't calm down until you step out in faith. Trust God. And it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm holding that spot right there. It says when the wind ceased. That I don't know if you were in Baltimore or in the surrounding area yesterday when, when, when the snowstorm was going and it started snowing. And at one moment it looked like it was dying down. And then the next moment, it looked like all of us were going to be like the Wizard of Oz and we were going to go somewhere. The storm had to get through its cycle. Some of us are praying for God to end the storm too early. And if he ends the storm too early, you don't get to learn the lesson that he's trying to teach you. So you've got to let the storm pass. Every time the storm doesn't need to end, sometimes the storm needs to pass so that you can learn what you're supposed to learn in the condition of what the storm brings. Sometimes, if I can tell somebody today, the storm is your catalyst. The storm is everything you need to toughen you back up and give you the resilience you need to know that the Lord is on your side. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you've been praying about the storm. All you need to do is say, Lord, don't end the storm. Just keep me through the storm. Because the storm is a catalyst for your next season of what you've been asking God to do. I'm just believing that the storm has to 
go its cycle. And the Bible says, at the end of the storm, at the end of people seeing you work through what you thought would kill you, at the end of people seeing you walk out something they have never seen before to forgive the unforgivable to do the unbelievable to move and operate in the unexpected and operating in the exceeding and the abundantly and the above all when people see you not run away from the storm not crouch down to the storm not beg the storm but you stand firm in the storm the bible says when people see it it says and this is what happened when they got back in the boat, they worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. I want to let you know today that you're still in the storm because people need to see you overcome. Sometimes you're in the storm because people need to see you break through. They can't see God, so they need to see you. Sometimes you're right in the middle and you're saying, God, take me out. But if he takes you out too early, you don't get to get the audience for people to say, my God, he must be the son of God if he changed your life. He must be the son of God if he changed your circumstances. He must be God if he brought you out, if he broke the addiction, if he healed your body. He must be. The son of God. So I want to preach from the topic today. <laughs> Sometimes you got to step out to step in. You got to step out of where you are to step into what God has for you to do. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to step out, to step in. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, musicians. I appreciate it. Y'all, can y'all help me give it up for our dream team that's in the house today serving big time? That's what's up. Tell your neighbor, step out to step in. Tell your second choice, step out to step in. Tell your third choice, say, I'm sorry you're my third choice, but step out to step in. Step out to step in. I'm just believing that's for somebody today. God is calling for you to step out, to step into the right set of circumstances, to step into the right place at the right moment that God has been orchestrating even before the foundation of the world. The Lord has called for you to step into your right zone. Anybody know you just got a zone? It's a place where you get into, where you're not worrying about what everybody else is doing, where you don't care what everybody else is saying, where you don't worry about how much they got. Not what they just bought, but you in your zone. It's a place where you step out and say, I'm willing to trust God with everything, for everything, in everything, because he is head of my life. I'm looking to Jesus, the Bible says, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. It's time to step out, to step in. I'm telling you this today because oftentimes it can be fearful to step out. I don't know if you know like me, but I, I was one of those late people who learned how to swim. Anybody, you, you, you learn in your adult age to learn how to swim. I'm one of those uh, people that stepped out and said, you know, I, I'm going to try out swimming. And, and, and if I can tell you today, you know, if you've got a child, get that child into swimming early because there is nothing like a grown adult, myself, going to speak straight on me, trying to get into the water, shake king telling the lord if you could help me walk on it better than i can swim in it i'll take that as well and i'm telling you that today because i i'll never forget i i, I spent some money i went to the ymca and and i wanted them to teach me how but there is something about when you're called to step out that it's fearful because you feel that when you step out you don't have any support around you i went i, I went swimming and and they tell you to get in the water. And, and, I'm, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm reading my surrounding. You got to read your surrounding because I got to know how deep this water is. Anybody know you're looking at the side of the gauge? I'm not, I'm not moving until I find out the footage in this water. I get in. It starts at about three feet. I feel good. Four feet. 
my faith starts to waver. Five feet, I know that the Lord is no longer with me. The Bible says his rod and staff, they comfort, but it was not comforting me at that moment. I step out into the water and I try to swim. And they tell you, all right, here's what you're about to do. You're about to leap out and kick your feet. The problem is, is that my brain doesn't have the ability to operate at the same time while keeping myself from drowning and making the decision to kick my feet. Because in my head, my feet need to be on the ground. So what you're telling me doesn't seem like it makes sense. But the only way you can swim is if your feet are off the ground. Now you have the fakers. You've seen them. They're tall enough to be in the pool. But they're doing this. And you under the water like, hey man, you're walking. You're not, you're not swimming talking about did I get anywhere no no you didn't there's something about when you're learning something new that you have to trust in the process and you have to trust in the process that even though you're fearful it's going to lead you to an outcome that you desire if I can pull my feet from off the ground and learn to swim and kick enough, then you know what? I'm making get somewhere. Well, I went through the lessons at the YMCA. Problem is, is there was no test at the end to determine if what I had learned could actually be put to this moment. Well, I went to Florida with the family, and we quick learned that whatever I thought I learned had not been applied as well as it should have been. When I went to make that leap and three feet, I thought I was going to lose it all. Till my wife yelled on the side, just stand up. You won't drown. Can I tell y'all, we will lose our very inclination of how to do the normal things when fear strikes. When fear gets in our heart, we get paralyzed. We we forget the understanding and the clarity of what we should do. And and we act instead of uh, thinking about what we have the ability to do. We're way more what? Reactive than we are what? Proactive. And I'll never forget, I got down there, my wife tried to teach me swimming. I think that's where we got a fragment of brokenness in our relationship because for some reason I did not trust her, just like I didn't trust the people at the Y. But what I know is you have to be determined enough and to have the carriage That what courage is, it's doing it in spite of. And so I kept getting up in the morning. And there was this couple. And the couple is sitting on the side and and the lady says, hey, are you, are you, what's going on? I said, I'm trying to learn how to swim. I tried to leave my wife and children so that I could have a surprise for them. Like when they woke up, like I learned y'all. It was either I learned or they didn't hear from me. It was going to be one of the two. And I said to I said, you know, I'm just trying to learn. And my wife comes out and we're by the pool and the hotel. And and she said, well, won't you just try this way? She said, won't you just try to dive in underneath and swim? I said, so you want me to be totally immersed (laughs) in this water? The craziest part about it is, is, I did this dive in and started swimming. And I started swimming and I was underwater. And y'all, you know how you get too happy about your blessing? Y'all, I was so happy. I was swimming my life away. 
I mean, I'm swimming back and forth. My wife is celebrating. I am excited. I am swimming my life away. The problem is, is that I'm underwater. My eyes are open. And I have no goggles. And we are at the public pool. Well, what you know is that there's something called chlorine. I thought it was chlorine. It felt like bleach. Like somebody just went in and said, here we go. That should be clean. When I got out of the pool, it was hazy. When I kept walking, I went blind. I couldn't see y'all. I went to dinner and, and, and it's messed up that your own people will laugh at you. I said, anybody want me to drive? Everybody said, no, 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 we're good. Thank you. I go and I'm trying to order food and, and I can't see because, because I, 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 my eyes are glazed over. I think people are feeding me peppers and stuff like that. I just can't see. And the problem oftentimes is because we're so scared of what will be the outcome of our lives that we never step out to step into something different. Here's the thing. I got over the fogginess, but yet I learned how to swim. Here's the thing that we're worried too much about is what will happen if I do. And we don't understand that the result of the uncomfortableness will go away. It's a part of the process. But some of us aren't stepping out in faith because we're so fearful of what will take place that we never get to experience what God calls exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Peter, in this moment, has realized that he is with the true and living God. But the Lord, the Bible says, at the fourth hour of the night comes walking on the water. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. If I'm out in the middle of the ocean and there is a storm happening and there is a body that starts walking to me, I promise you, I'm thinking about how we about to fight. That's what's coming into our mind. Do you see that? I see that. Do you see that? I see that. I can see the disciples saying, Am I, I promise you, bro, with tears coming down their eyes, wherever it is, we going to tear this thing up. Jesus comes in and says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. It's me because what fear does, it will make you miss and that you cannot see when God is in the midst. The Bible says the Lord is there and he walks up to him and says, do not be afraid. Because fear is the first thing that grips us. And when fear grips us, it keeps us from moving in faith. The Bible lets us know that Jesus tells him, he says, listen, 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 listen. It's just me. Calm down. Chill out. It's okay. I want to go off our first point today. Our first thought in our series, Unapologetic, is that you need to be able to expect the unexpected. So many times, some of us operate in the place of so much consistency that we're never looking for things to change. We're always looking for things to be the same, the same way I operate, the same way I do. Now, there is nothing wrong with consistency, but there's something wrong with consistency without a vision. You can be consistent, just make sure there's a goal or a vision at the end of your consistency. Because consistency for consistency's sake doesn't bring about a result to anything. You got to expect the unexpected. Can I, can I tell you today, you have to be able to expect the unexpected. That's why every day with Jesus is so important. Because the Bible says, I want what? Daily bread. I want God to give me what? Understanding and clarity. I want God to give me revelation for what? The day. Because the day changes, so that means the word of what God wants to speak in the day will change with the day. Some of us, we operate as if we were 10 years ago in the today's present. And you're trying to act like, well, that's not how we did it last year. The problem is, is last year is not this year. That's why they called it last year. 
and you're trying to do what you did last year in this year. The year changed, but we didn't change. Some of us even now, as, as, as we're coming to different season in this pandemic, everybody's like, man, I just wanted things to get back to normal. The problem is, is normal is yesterday. Why do you want yesterday's blessings if tomorrow's blessings are greater? That's the thing. We think normal means I don't have to operate in faith. I don't have to move any further than where I am. I don't really have to extend myself. But the truth of the matter is, is that you need to be able to be shaken by what God is doing so that you can believe God for what's happening tomorrow, not believing God for what happened yesterday. Because if you're believing God for what happened yesterday, the problem is, is yesterday already happened. So you don't need faith for, for what God already did. You need faith for what God is about to do. You got to expect the unexpected. You got to expect what's not about to happen. You got to expect God to do uh, uh, the things that you've never seen before. You've got to expect God to move in ways you've never expected him to be moved before. That's why your prayer life would be so dynamic is because you would be expecting God to answer prayers for things you haven't seen yet. What, do, my, what are you expecting God to do in this moment, in this year, at this time? that you haven't seen God do before. You're like, I just want him to keep me. He kept you yesterday. He's pretty good at that. He's proven himself. He can keep you. What else? Can I explain real quick why some of us don't have expectation? It's because the Lord has already done enough to meet the level of where we never thought we would get to that we never dreamed or envisioned anything greater than where we are today. And we haven't given ourselves permission. Somebody say permission. You haven't given yourself permission to go any further, to envision any greater, to see any greater than where you are because you're still stuck getting over that God got you out of the last thing. And if you could see that God could do greater, you would envision for greater because every greater is not dependent on the need. The greater is dependent on what you can ask for. If you can't ask for it, you can't receive. Bible says, ask and you shall what? Receive. Seek and you shall what? Find. Knock and what? The door shall be open. Some of us are giving God our expectations in a context of acting like God should know. God says, I know, but the problem is, is you didn't activate my word. And my word says you have to ask in order to what? Receive. Other than that, we don't do any work in the process of asking, which is an object of helping us to believe by faith in what God would do. We're just expecting God to do. Anybody ever went up to a door ring or you seen somebody at a ring and they don't knock on the door or ring the ring? They just stand there expecting you to answer the door. And they stare into the ring like, I know you see me. I know you see me right here. Come answer the door. And you're like, why didn't you what? Ring the doorbell because we think because we're in front or we're in God's presence that God has to answer because I'm what visible. But the Bible says, no, if you look according to his word, he says, when you ask it, you shall receive it. We're just standing in prayer like this. I know you see me. I know you see all that I'm going through. He said, I don't need you to identify the problem. I need you to speak to the problem. Woo. You got to speak to that problem. Lord, I see what is happening in this moment. I need for you to do greater. Here's the thing. God isn't always only solving problems, but God is doing more than meeting needs. God is in the blessing business. Some of us are only praying about a need. Here's the thing. You don't understand that God has delivered you out of the season of that need. So you stop praying. But the problem is, is you need to be praying so that God can do greater. So I prayed for the, for the job. 
and the Lord gave me the job. And I'm just grateful. No, no. Lord, you got me in this door. All right, so how many more promotions do I have? You know somebody around you, but you don't need a promotion. Just thank God for what you got. God didn't call me to be satisfied. He said I could be content until he does the next thing. But he didn't tell for me to be satisfied. Because he already, why can't you be satisfied? Because he already said I would do greater things. So why would I be satisfied when God has already given me greater? Somebody didn't catch that. Oh, somebody didn't catch that. Because your expectation is the only way that God can work is if I am in need. Here's the thing. I'm always in need for more. Lord, give me a job. There you go. Lord, give me a promotion. There you go. Lord, I want to own the company. There you go. God, help me to make another location. There you go. God's like, I, you keep asking. I'll keep giving. But some of us have stopped asking because we've gone further than we thought we would. So we're saying, just be grateful. And God's saying, you're losing out on everything I already have in store for you. That will be done on earth as it's already declared, what? In heaven. Lord, what do you have in store for me in heaven that I have not seen manifested on earth? Because whatever it is, I need to see every drip of it. When I see him in heaven, I don't want to see no reserves, no extras, nothing that was in the corner for me. I need everything that God has for me. I want to expect the unexpected. I walk and they said it's free. I knew it was free. I just didn't know when it was going to be free. Why? Because I was expecting God to do what? the unexpected I don't know when he's going to do it but I'm expecting him to do it scripture lets us know in Isaiah 55 and 8 it says this the Lord says my thoughts and my ways are not like yours why because some of your thoughts and ways are broken and if my thoughts and waves are like your thoughts and waves, then I would only bless you when you do good, and I would always curse you when you did bad. And I would leave out what? My faithfulness and my love and my forgiveness and my kindness and my grace. You would never see the extent of who I am. Why? Because you would think my ways are your ways. And God says, I'll bless you when you don't deserve it. I'll heal you when you don't deserve it. I'll keep you when you don't deserve it. I'll pull you out when you don't deserve it. Why? Because you just called on the name of the Lord. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You got to expect the unexpected point. Number two is you got to challenge the moment. Some of you are afraid to challenge Jesus. I'm not scared. I put him to the test. What can you do? You say you can do exceedingly. What can, what can, what have you ever asked God, what can you do? We easily will say God can do anything. You don't pray like God can do anything. What, oh, what, mm, what could God do in your life that you never could imagine him doing for you? If you believed it, you would pray it. And you would challenge the moment that you're in. But because we don't oftentimes believe it, we don't challenge it because we think it's against reverencing God. God's like, I have more than you can imagine or think. And you're worrying about challenging me? I was watching yesterday a a, a YouTube, and there's a gentleman on there. He was showing a house. And the house, 18,000 square feet, seven bedrooms, 13 baths. I looked at it. I said, my Lord. Let me tell you what the first mind that is captured in a moment may say. You know, that's a little excessive. That's a little much. You know why we say things like that? 
because we haven't seen things like that. And so we put lids on the things that we haven't seen nor understand. If God wants to bless me with the seven bedroom, 13 bath at 18,000 square feet, what I'm not going to do is tell God, that's a little excessive, Lord. I'm going to say the mixed church has moved to my seven bedroom, 13 bath, and we're going to worship God on the deck together. God bless everybody. That's where we'll be holding growth track at. Where's growth track? PM's house. When all of y'all there and it's got 13 bathrooms, you won't think it's excessive then. You know why sometimes things are excessive? Because of who you're in the boat with. Tavon, you, you can't share everything you want to do because there's some people in the boat who don't see it the way you see it. There's, there, there's, there's 11 other people in the boat who can't imagine that. That's just way, that's just excessive. That's just too much. God couldn't do that with all that I've done and all that I've gone through. And, 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 and they can't see it. But there is something that God has laid on your heart that is greater than what you ever want to share with anybody because it seems eccentric. And God is saying today, don't you worry about what everybody else thinks. What am I telling you? We're worried about everybody else in the boat. You know how the boat is. You think I should ask the Lord, will you, like, real quick, you think he just, you know, you need to stop consulting with people about visions that they haven't even seen. That thing is greater than what I've ever seen. That thing is greater than, than what, what, what we've done together. That thing is greater than what we've ever gone out to. That thing is greater. How much we going to, man, we, we, we going here, and we going to get this, and we going and we gonna to stay there, and you're like, no, that's a little bit too much. I just think that's excessive. It's excessive because you haven't seen it. And you haven't been open to something greater than where you are. I'll never forget, y'all, I'm going to talk about this for real, for real. I'll never forget buying my first, like, $200 pair of shoes. And I'll never forget that because when you come out of a state, you tend to think that your state is the state of where everyone else should be. And anybody over your state doesn't really understand what it is to be humble and gracious. And, and so we live out there. I'll never forget, I was buying a pair of shoes. And, and I was in a, 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 the Saxon and in, in Arundel Mills. And, and it's like the outlet. And I looked at these pair of shoes. And Charles, I looked at them, and they were $200. And my wife said, you should get them. I said, you have lost your mind. <laughs> Aldo's is right around the corner. And they got some shoes for $51.99. You know how much I'm saving? Now, this is, this is not to anybody with Aldo shoes because I wore them. But God had changed. God had changed where Peter was a fisher men to a fisher of men. Where he picked them up where he didn't really believe in and where he really didn't understand the clarity is different than the Peter that was now that had just seen the 5,000 plus just be fed and, and had his hand in it. It's a different season. So you do not speak against people for the season that they're in. But when you've changed your season, stop apologizing for the season you're in. And I was like, oh, these shoes are. And my wife was like, here's what you have to understand. If you buy these pair of shoes, you're not going to have to buy two and three more pairs of the shoes that you normally get. Because all you're going to have to do is put the taps on the back of them so it doesn't wear off the heel and these shoes will last longer than you getting a different pair of shoes every time something comes up because they got worn out or they got scratched and you know about that aldo scratch once it's in there it ain't coming out buddy i don't care how much shoe polish you got you'll just have one shiny side of the shoe and i remember saying to her no 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 it's a, and she said you got to understand, we're not talking about more for the sake of more. We're talking about more for the sake of impact. You can get more from this than just staying where you were. Some of you are scared to move into the next step of what God has called for you to do because you're scared 
that people are going to see you a different way because of the increase in favor of what God has done, but they don't understand the level of faith that you had to operate out of it when you did not have sax money and you had a BOGO kind of lifestyle. Nobody saw that. So don't stay where you are to please people's minds, emotions, and thoughts. You've got to leave the 11 behind and say sometimes to yourself, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. If that's my house, you tell me and I'll get them keys. Because I don't have time to listen to where people who have not been yet tell me where to get to. Some of us are operating that. We're not believing God for the healing in our life. Because we've only seen God do just enough for someone else. And you're like, Pastor, I'm with cancer and, and I'm down. I'm like, you need to pray that thing through then. Well, I, God doesn't do that level. God does every level. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what stage you're in. It doesn't matter what's happening. God can make it dry up in the middle of the middle. The Bible says immediately. God can do things immediately if you have the faith to believe. Challenge the moment. When Jacob was with the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the Bible says in Genesis 32, 26, then he said, let me go. This is the angel. Let me go for the day has broken. If you want it bad enough, you'll hold on like you dear life. The Bible says, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. How long you been in prayer? Until I get something from the Lord. Who are you yelling out? It's the Lord. You're like, what are y'all doing? We're wrestling. You look crazy. I look crazy, but I got crazy faith. And I'm willing to wrestle God through this prayer until he's willing to give me an answer. Because I need God to go beyond what I just feel naturally. I need to be able to step out so that I can step into a new place that God has called for me to be. Because unlike you, I'm just saying this to myself. I don't like being and staying where I already am. I need to see greater. Point number three. Don't reject your request. Don't. Don't self-sabotage because it's greater than what you've ever seen and realized in your life. Some of us will find ourselves to talk, we'll talk ourselves out of our own blessings. Well, you know, this probably isn't for me because, you know, you know, I haven't been the greatest Christian. You know, this, this probably isn't for me because, you know, you know, that stuff that I did before and I messed up. <laughs> you forgot where he said it's brand new mercies every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. So far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed our sin. Lord, could you be using me today? Could, could you be using me today to do what I think I would never do? Some of us are so frustrated with our healing that we go back into our broken states because we thought it was too fast. No, I just need, I need a little bit more time for God. God said, no, no, I already healed you. But if you want to keep picking the wound to feel good about where you are, you can do that. But I want to speak over someone's life today that the Bible is letting you know you're healed. You're not waiting for healing. You're not waiting for a mindset change. It's changing. You're in process of what God is calling for you to do. But you have to step out to step 
in. My question today is what do you need to step out of so that you can step into what God has for you? We got to step out. You know, to step out, ooh. <laughs> you know, to step out of a boat onto water means you have to step out from a higher ground into a lower space. So many of us believe that stepping out is only about stepping up. But some of you don't know it's stepping into something that looks lower, but it's something that's never been done before. Well, why would I go into that position? God's like, mm -hmm. if you go into that position, it leads to a position that no one else has. You're like, but I'm not going to go lower. I'm not, I'm not going to sacrifice what I'm doing to see what could be. No, 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 no. You're stepping out to step in. I've got to step out of the boat and step into the water, which is moving and it's rough. Well, how long did they say the position was? They said they're not even sure how long they're going to keep me. But I hear God saying, step out. I'm not sure how long this is going to work and I'm not sure how long we can continue this way. But some of you are hearing God say, step out. Some of you are in the season and God has placed you at the right place, but your mind is getting in the way of what you think. And the Lord is saying, step out. You say, there's no possibility I can step out. You don't know my bills. You don't understand what I got to do. And the Lord says, I'll do greater than you could ever imagine or think. I just need for you to step out. Some of us will never experience the level of what God wants to do because we're too scared to step out. Stepping out looks like stepping down. But stepping down and stepping into a place that no one else has been before. Not one of those disciples will ever be able to say that they walked on water. What if I fail? What if you do? Is he not able to keep you from falling? Is he not able to present you faultless? My question that Jesus asked today is why do you doubt? Lord, I, I doubt because of how much I've obtained. I doubt because of I don't want to lose what I have. I doubt because I've worked so hard to get to where I am that I can't imagine life without it. And the Lord says, the life that you're imagining is not even the life I have for you. I have, somebody say greater. Can you just tell your neighbor real quick, just, just tap them and say, God's got greater. Can you look at your second choice? Because they need a little bit more. They need somebody else to talk to them. They need two or three to gather together and touch and agree. Can you look at your second choice and say, God's got greater? Can you just find one more person that's going to be your third choice and say, I'm sorry you're my third choice. But I need to tell you, God's got greater. Now, if you believe that, give God a praise in this place that he's got greater for you. Come on, anybody in expectation that God has got greater? Anybody believe he can do more than you could imagine or think? Anybody got a praise that was unexpected? I didn't come here believing today was going to change, but I have an unexpected expectation that when I get home, God's changing my situation. When I get to work, God's changing my situation. I'm expecting the unexpected. I'm expecting the unexpected. I'm stepping out to step in. I'm stepping out to step in. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'm stepping out to step in. I'm stepping into a new ground. I'm stepping into a new place. God, you're going to do more than I can imagine or think. Greater is he that's operating in me than he that is in the world. I'm not worried about a boss. I'm not worried about the devil. I'm not worried about the doctor. I'm not worried about the lawyer. It's all about what God says. If he says come, then I will come. I'm stepping out to step in. I'm stepping out to step in. I'm excited about what God has for me. I'm excited about what God has in store for you. I'm excited about the next level of where God is taking you.
I'm excited about the next financial bracket you're walking into. I'm excited about the next door that God is opening. I'm excited about the next position that you're going to walk in and sit in. I'm excited for what God is going to do in your marriage. I'm excited about what God is going to do in your life. I'm excited about the business that God is going to expand. I'm excited. Why? Because I'm expecting the unexpected. I'll step out to step in. I'll step out to step in. I'll step out from the 11 to step into God's blessings. I'll step out to step into a miracle. I'll do whatever it takes to see God manifest what he has in my life. God can do in more than I could even imagine or think. And I want to get that in somebody's head today. You're doubting the set of circumstances that God can speak over. And I want to tell you today, God can do more than you could ever imagine or think. I'm saying miracles right now in my house. Miracles right now in my life. Miracles over my family. Miracles over my friends. Miracles over my church. Miracles over everything in my life. Why? Because he can do great things. But you got to step out to step in. You can have your seat. I'm ending. I want to speak to some men in the house. You're asking me the question, Pastor, how do I reclaim my life? How do I reclaim the leadership that God has spoken over my life? I'm going to tell you this. It is not about staying in the safe zone. It is about walking in the faith that God has placed in you. As a man of God with dominion and a man of God operating in who God's called for you to be, you must be able to lead out of faith. You cannot lead out of what you see. But I'm speaking this today that God is calling for us to lead as leaders. And leaders have to lead in faith. For the Bible lets us know the only way you can really truly please the Lord is when you live out of the faith that God has placed on the inside of you. Because I don't want to get you twisted. Your faith is not of yourself. But your faith is from the seed that God has already planted on the inside of you. Women of God, I want to let you know today to be everything that God has called for you to be. You cannot rest where you are and you cannot accept what everyone tells you. You have to be in a place where you're willing to step out of the comfort zone to look crazy. You got to look crazy to step into a new place. You got to look crazy. They're going to talk about me. Yes, they are. That's what people do when they have not been where you are. We talk about what we don't know because it's our way of comfort for the things we cannot explain. You know, that was just crazy that they just did that and they're going to go ahead and try to, you know, and, and apply for that. That is just too much. I don't think it's too much. Because whatever you have vision for, God can fulfill. If you don't have vision for it, God can't fulfill it. God's going to use me to change a country. If you have vision for it, God can do it. How are you going to do it? It's a certain amount of money I need. What's the money you need? You got to be able to envision it. Whatever you cannot envision, you cannot expect to receive. If you can't see a whole family, guess what? It's going to be hard for you to get a vision from God of how to put a whole family together. If you can't see a healthy marriage, I want to tell you today, it's going to be hard for you to get an understanding and clarity of how to produce a healthy marriage. Why? Because you don't have vision for it. The responsibility that God is calling for us to live through and live out it's in this moment in presence and understanding, Lord, whatever you have for me to do, I am willing to do it now. I believe this. The more you step out is the more you'll see God's hand move. It doesn't matter if you start drowning because as soon as you call on the name of the Lord, the Bible says immediately he'll save you. So there is a risk in your faith. You're like, I don't want no risk. I'm like, well, then stay there. Because your salvation can be sealed, but the problem is without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you're going to have to come back to a place of faith where you start trusting God for that which is not seen. Can I speak this over your life today? 
I believe you could see God do incredible things if you would stop consulting with the 11. Here's what I know is true. Yes, it's scary. Yes, that's crazy. Yes, I wouldn't do it. Everything they probably were saying and thinking was actually probably true. Real quick. Every person that gives you a reality check is not speaking lies. We love to create haters for the sake of our comfort because we have the idea that we can do everything. You can do all things through Christ. So some things that people are saying are actually truths. We don't like that. No, no, because they're they telling me wrong. No, they're telling you right. But the problem is, is that your faith has to overcome even that truth. You remember when the 12 spies walked into Canaan? They weren't speaking lies. They were speaking truths. There's giants in the land. They're the Amalekites. They're the Amorites. They, were, they, were not, they weren't telling lies. They were speaking truths. The enemy has spoken some truths. It's going to be hard. That money ain't going to come as quick as you think. If you make that, you're going to have to sacrifice some stuff. And you like, y'all just hating. No, no, they tell them some truths. The problem is, though, is having the faith to overcome what seems like a negative truth. Because we can have a truth that has been wrapped in negativity to keep us from fulfilling the call and purpose of what God is speaking. Know the difference. You don't have to call them a hater. You just got to recognize they don't understand the spin on what God is going to do. Yes, it's going to cost me. Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes, I'm not going to like where I'm going. But guess what, baby? At the end of that thing, once you see God work with me the way he works with me, when I get back and I show y'all what he's done with me, all of y'all are going to say, truly, this is the son of God. You'll get back and you'll say, truly, yeah, yeah, it was uncomfortable. Yeah, it did mess up some stuff. Yes, we did have some arguments about it, but we still trust in the Lord. And that's what I'm telling you today. You got to trust in the Lord and believe that he is able to do more than you could ever imagine.